Go. Hi guys, so my name is Caitlin Bell. Today I'm presenting on Mono Lake in uh, California. So Mono Lake is a saline lake. Um, it's actually a hypersaline lake. It has a pH of about 9.8 um, and a salinity of about 8.2%, which is twice as salty as the ocean. The pH that's somewhere in between um, like a toothpaste and then detergent. So this is really kind of brand both ends of that. Uh, it sits about 350 miles north of Los Angeles and 100 mile, 180 miles east of San Francisco. So I tried um, drawing that out here for those of us who went to Death Valley this spring break. That's just like right here. And then we have um, the Sierra Nevada Mountains and then the White Mountains in the east. And so um, Mark Twain came and visited this in the 1960s. Um, he described it as a solemn, silent, sailless sea of a lake. Uh, and it was a lonely tenant of the loneliest spot on earth, sitting in a lifeless, treeless, hideous desert. Um, today, that was a very popular tourist destination for uh, its tufa formations. Um, the area is one of the most geologically active and volcanically active um, <coughs> locations in North America, um, although we can't talk about that today. We just don't have enough time, so if you're interested in that, you should definitely look into it. Um, so the reason that this has such restrained chemistry is actually that it sits in a closed basin, so it has not spilled out out of its basin since, it, uh, at least since its last spatial cycle. Um, and as a result, uh, nothing can leave, and only water can leave by evaporation from the surface. <coughs> uh, yeah, although, while it creates such an extreme environment, it's really good for paleoclimatic studies, and we'll talk about that later. Um, so if you want an idea about the size of Mono Lake, it, at its present, it's about 1,945 uh, 1, meters high, so above sea level, and then it has a surface area about 160 kilometers. Um, and so I took a, used Google Maps essentially, and this is Rock Island and its extent, sitting on top of Mono Lake. And then there's our campus as a little bit of an overestimate. So uh, Mono Lake is actually about 3.8 times larger than Rock Island and about 70 kilometers uh, squared bigger than Walt Disney World. So if you want a little bit of an idea there. Um, in the middle of the lake, uh, there are two different volcanically <coughs> formed islands and then eight acapella, um, acapella were islands that were formed due to um, some structural deformation of the lake sediments. That's just some really good structural geology here too. Um, so, oh, and if you want a little bit, so Lake Mono is actually a remnant lake of Lake Russell, which was named after a pioneering geologist in this area. And Lake Russell actually got much, much larger. It had, um, it was about a little over 2,000 meters above sea level, and um, of course its surface area is a lot larger. So this is about the extent of Lake Russell here. Mono Lake is in here, and that may not look like a huge difference on this figure, but if you consider that um, these are all mountains and canyons here, so the farther up it goes, it just has a really deep... Uh, okay, so first of all, I'm going to talk about the geomorphology, it's just general geology, and then I'm going to touch more on the biogeomorphology of this area. So we're going to move this a little bit faster. Um, so uh, some of the first research into this was looking <coughs> at the topography underneath the lake. So we know for sure that there is a uh, basin called Johnson, Johnson's Basin um, beneath the lake and a 169 foot deep depression within the lake, which is about here. Um, it's just like to the east of the Pajo Island, which is the largest of the two islands in the lake. <coughs> so they uh, were able to study topography under the lake using acoustic soundings, kind of like how seismologists will use uh, seismic ways to study underground uh, formations. What they found is that there's actually hummocky topography, uh, what we should see kind of here, by Pajo Lake uh, Island. And most of that, or some of that's from lava flows, because it's a very volcanically active island. But most of that's actually slumping uh, from the soils. And so actually there's a lot of geomorphically young indicators for Pajo Island and its formation. So there's no drainage system developed yet. No uh, shoreline scars from the Pleistocene, Lake Russell. Um, and then also there's the slumping in the area is very obviously fresh. Um, and also for paleoclimate studies, 
Uh, down here in the basin, they found about 40 to 50 feet deep worth of uh, trans, uh, acoustically translucent sediment. And so what this means is that <coughs> uh, it has about the same sound velocity as the water, so it's very tur uh, turbulent, gassy water, not gassy water. Um, and so that shows that at the time, uh, sorry, uh, it, it just shows a change in the salinity and um, the rates of deposition in that base at the time. So, let me go on. The Golson Creek Formation is one of the most well studied formations in Mono Lake. It has about seven meters of lake sediment um, sitting on top of sands and gravels. And um, actually, we're finding more and more that it correlates with formations outside the Mono Lake Long Valley area. Um, which gives us a much broader paleoclimate story. Um, and as you see here, there's very distinct layering, but what you can't exactly see in this picture, <coughs> these might be it, um, is there's actually ice rafted drop stones. So these are large class that were clearly that brought in on there just by normal stream deposition. And so for the longest time, uh, scientists thought that this was just an indicator of glaciers reached the lake at some point. But actually what it is, the, um, Susan Zimmerman found this, she did her dissertation on Mono Lake, was that when uh, fresh water was coming over the top of the saline waters, it would not initially mix because they have a very different density, and as a result it would freeze on top of the lake, but it would capture sediments with it at that time, um, carry it out further in the lake, and then melt and drop those in those areas. And uh, so you actually get a really cool geologic story just from knowing that little bit of uh, information because Wilson Creek is really well situated. It's right at the base of the mountains um, and so it caught a lot of different kinds of sediments. So not only do we get sediments that tell us about what was at the tops of the mountains when they were eroding, but it tells us uh, about the glaciers at that time. And the difference about whether or not these drop zones came in through glaciers versus um, the ice on top of the lake is very, very important. Um, it actually gives us two completely different pictures. So for if the glaciers came, that means that this was at a time of a, a glacial peak, and the glaciers had reached the lake. But this story is actually telling us that the glaciers never did reach the lake, and that this was actually a time of glacial minimum when uh, they were melting at that time. Um, and so, I don't know, that's really cool about what I love about geology. So, um, this, so, like I said, one of the draws to Mono Lake is the tufas. And so tufas are these, um, they're essentially kind of like an aerated limestone. There's both the towers kind of like I had in the, in the first picture at the very intro of my <coughs> presentation. And then these are sand tufas. Um, so first of all, what you need to understand, in Los Angeles in 1941 diverted waters that were feeding into Mono Lake um, to feed about 15% of the city's needs. And they still do this. Um, but they were doing it in kind of a very uncontrolled way. So between 1941 and 1982, uh, the lake actually dropped 14 meters um, in such a short time. And so, but it's allowed us to study tufas like we never have before, because tufas form uh, purely underwater. So they're hard to reach. <laughs> it's not land. Um, so one, one study described Mono Lake Perfect. They said that uh, Mono Lake chemistry is basically that of an evaporating dish fed by the mineral laden waters of a volcanically active area. I just thought that was a very fun sentence. But um, so, what happens how these form, especially the towers, is when fresh water meets saline waters. <coughs> and saline waters are high in ions, kind of like sodium and uh, trace metals and stuff like that, but it's really deficient in calcium. Um, has, oh, it's also high in carbonates and sulfates. And so when the fresh water brings in calcium, it, it reacts with the carbonates and creates a calcium carbonate, which is these tufas. Uh, <clears throat> they still form today when the lake water is below a temperature of zero degrees Celsius, but once it gets above that, uh, the materials are really replaced by a pseudomorph. Um, for those, those of you who haven't had mineralogy yet, a pseudomorph is a mineral that replaces another mineral and kind of takes on its shape. Um, and that pseudomorph is called phenolite. And there's a few others, but that's the main one. Sand tufas, like this one, are a little bit different. It's essentially when the fresh water comes in through quartz sand. 
um, but it has all the same chemical reactions. It just traps a little bit in different things. It has a different formation too. This is a lot softer. If you were to poke it, it would just fall apart. Um, the two foot on the sh south shore of the lake are 200 and 900 years old, and they grow. Uh, we know this because two foot grow about one inch per year. Um, and if you think, um, these are important for climate studies as well, especially lake level, because if these form underwater, the lake level couldn't have been here. It had to be all the way up here. And when we have that very beginning picture, those can be meters above where the lake is up now, and those are actually can be really far from where the lake shorelines are actually now. So they're a good indicator where Lake Russell was at one time and for how long it was at that height. Um, you can also uh, do a radiocarbon content of the calcium carbonates to get more exact date. So the two factors are going to come and tie into our biology and morphology. Uh, and I know this isn't a lot of your guys' thing, but you're going to love this. Okay, so just to give a really basic ecology, about one million birds visit Mono Lake each year. Um, the, they feed on a simple ecology uh, of like brine flies and brine shrimp, and they feed on little microbes. <coughs> uh, when the water drop was at its most extreme land bridge forms, and then the coyotes coyotes decimated bird populations. So as a result, now Mono Lake is a protected area. Um, so there's actually some really interesting impacts for uh, every 10 meters. It just After about 30 meters, it can completely decimate the life cycle there. But we're not, if you want to go over that, we can talk about it after this. Um, so what I like to focus on is the microbes here. So they actually have a really big impact on the lake that uh, a lot of people don't think about because they're not so easy to just look at. Uh, so first of all, we have certain microbes. They're called chas chasmonidoliths, sorry, and cryptonidoliths. So indoliths, uh, which is that the at the root of that, um, are organisms that live within rocks or within the crevices of rocks, um, like in between mineral grains. And so you can actually find these within meters below ground um, in hard bedrock. But these specific ones are um, this type of species that live on the subsurface of the earth. Um, so what's important about these guys is, like I said, the sand tufa, tufa especially is very fragile. So scientists started asking, like, why do we still see these despite the variations in lake level and extreme weather that we've seen in this area before? And so what they found is there's actually these microbes that can excrete uh, magnesium silicas from their membranes uh, post-mortem. And so uh, it actually creates more of a concrete formation for these in between each of the grains of the sand tufa. <coughs> um, so they can actually look at the growth of almost like rings of biofilm within these tufas. And by looking at those biofilms, they think that they can start looking at those as an indication of bio, uh, paleoclimate and paleosalinity because they grow in very specific uh, chemistries and very specific um, growth patterns as a response to the solutions around them. Um, it can also it's a really great interest to exobiologists who study life on other planets as well. Okay, so we're going to get to learn a little bit of cell biology really fast. Uh, so, some organisms have, rather than excreting different minerals, they're actually able to bring it in and change it. Um, so, specifically, I'm looking at microorganisms that reduce sulfate and others that oxidize, oxidize uh, arsenic. And so, um, I don't know where this went. When we look, that's adorable. Hey. <laughs> oh, here we go. Okay, so this is a membrane of a cell. Um, and each of these little cells are different types of proteins. So in order to create energy cells, uh, they pass along electrons. So you see this electron goes on, and it goes over to the oxygen over here. So that's how our cells function. Um, but with the cells of these organisms I'm talking about, there's either sulfate here or an arsenic. Um, and then after that, they 
they, it reignite, excites the electron and passes it to the ATP producer. And ATP is a, like a bundle up uh, package of energy. Um, so if you don't require oxygen for this process, you don't need to be, you can live in oxygen deficient environments, which for, a, for an environment this extreme is very important. So, um, the sulfate reduction from microbes, specifically for sulfates, accounts for 41% of the mineralization of the annual primary production in Mono Lake. <coughs> Sorry. Um, and then, so how they detect this is they're able to look within the sediment and look for distributions, distributions of sulfates and sulfides and the concentrations of them in the sediment. Um, these behave very similar to ones that we've seen in marine and freshwater environments. Okay, um, but uh, <laughs> um, but they're really exotic in a way. Let's, let's do the arsenic really fast. There's also two different species of arsenic um, reducers or oxidators. Um, they're really important. They're actually looking at them. It's the same process. Um, there's about 15 parts per billion of arsenic in Mono Lake. Um, so they're look, but these are changing that concentration currently in Mono Lake. So they're looking at using them for bioremediation in coal mines and in aquifers for uh, West Bengal and Bangladesh. So you guys might be asking yourself. Why the hell am I learning about biology right now? I'm here for a geology class, and why should I care? Um, more and more, we're seeing that uh, science is getting very interdisciplinary. Nick wants to be a geophysicist. I want to be a geomicrobiologist. I'm sure a lot of you guys have a mix of interest in how you're going to combine those and have like new discoveries as a result. Um, and biology is getting a lot of attention in geology. Um, like I said in a lot of these slides, it can be used for paleoclimate studies, it can be used um, in stratigraphy, we talk a lot about that, and a variety of different things, especially since life is going back farther and farther than we used to think. Um, and it does be good to hear some new things. Um, so, <laughs> uh, does anybody have any questions? If we have time for questions, I don't think so. One quick question. 